we welcome Taylor Henderson and Aaron Longoria to the show. How are you doing? Doing well. Yeah. Been a good day so far. Yeah. yeah. Not bad for a Monday. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Did you have a nice weekend? I did. Um, God, what did I do this weekend? I did some work. Uh, did some studying. Yeah. Ate some really good barbecue. Where? Uh, all the King's Men. So. Oh. Here in uh, here in Bryan. Oh. Yeah. Downtown. I don't think I. Oh no, I have been there. <laughs> is yep. it? It's right next to the theater. Right next to the theater. Yes, yep. I have yep. been there. This place, place is very good. Pretty good. And then ate cookies for dinner because I was so full. So. <laughs> There we go. I, you don't need a reason to eat cookies for dinner, though. This is also I mean, true. We've all yeah. been there. Yeah, we have been there. Yeah. yeah. You said what kind they were earlier, but for the listeners. Oatmeal raisin. Yes. My mm-hmm. brother-in-law thinks that oatmeal is a bad add to any cookie. Interesting. And he's wrong. Yeah. He's wrong. Josh, you're wrong. <laughs> but it was his birthday yesterday, so oh, happy, well, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Josh. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. less wrong because it was Even, his yeah, birthday. Yeah, I'm about to say, yeah. What did you do this weekend, Taylor? <laughs> Well, let's see. Uh, I hosted a dinner party Saturday night for some of the girls that we work with. Cheers. Um, So I cooked up a storm. And then yesterday, kind of the basic stuff, church, veg, did some laundry, uh, watched a lot of TV. Yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) Where do you go to church? uh, A&M United Methodist. That was where my family went when I was born. Wow. Yeah. Taking Holly. it back here. It's been around. I was like a thousand years ago. Is that how long that was? <laughs> In the beginning. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Give us 60 seconds on your road to Mays. Taylor, we'll start with you. Um, well, so I um, came to AM as an undergrad. I finished in 2011 with a communications degree mm-hmm. and didn't really know what I wanted to do, sort of thought PR, sort of thought uh, special event kind of stuff. So then I ended up back near home for me, which is the Beaumont area at Lamar University. I was working for um, the Division of University Advancement. So I was doing donor relation functions uh, really at the for the office of the president. Mm-hmm. And from there, um, after a year, decided to go back to school and I worked on my MBA. And it was through that program, I was poached to a private high school in the Beaumont area where I did recruitment and admissions work for about four years um, and then was poached back to Lamar for uh, to run their scholarships office and run their financial literacy campaign. So I did that for a little bit. And then my husband was, he accepted a job here. Um, gosh, when was that? November of 19, 18. And I started here in February of 19. So yeah, that's what brought me here. I appreciate your use of the word poached. I like the word <laughs> poached in this context. It really happens. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Aaron? So I uh, actually started out, I was a transfer student into Texas A&M. Great. Uh, I spent my first two years of college up at Colorado State. Uh, finished up here in about 2009. Um, and then prior to that, I really kind of spent my career in talent acquisition, mm-hmm. spent my career in HR. Um, I, I worked for a software company up in the Dallas area for about six years. Right. Uh, and then in 2016, uh, my wife accepted a job here mm-hmm. uh, in the Brighton College Station area, so we moved back. Um, so I worked remotely for a good amount of time, uh, still for that software company, and I found a gig here in town, uh, working for, obviously it's in my bio, uh, with, with Wayfair. Right. Um, and then opportunity came about um, here with the Career Center. Uh, I thought it was, it was very unique, you know, just kind of working with Working with students, and I always had a passion with working for, um, or I, I'm sorry, working with university students, recruiting like interns, uh, and just helping develop careers, you know, kind of as they're just jumping out mm-hmm. uh, of college. Uh, and so I was like, you know what, let's let's take a shot um, and go for it. And about a year and a half, here I am. So, yeah. So you're both TAMU undergrads <laughs> yep. and yep. both originally relocated back to the community for other reasons. Mm-hmm. And then ended up here. That's interesting. Uh, I wonder if there's a pattern to that. Maybe. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Maybe uh, so. Maybe. I feel yeah. like the university just sucks you back one way or another. Yeah. It all comes full circle. <laughs> Happened with me for sure. Yeah. yeah. Happened with me Absolutely. for sure. How many, so Taylor, we'll start with you again. How many in your family growing up? Uh, just kids, just me and one other. I have a younger brother who's 11 years younger than I am. Wow. 11 years. He is a freshman at East Texas Baptist University. Okay. Mm-hmm. What what was that relationship like? I mean, I mean, since he's your only brother, mm-hmm. you may like, you don't really have another frame of reference, but how would you say, what would you say it's like? Um, well, when he was really young. So when I was in high school, like 15, 16, he was four and five. So he was terribly annoying um and (laughs) you know just like doing the whole toddler like young kid thing um kind of obnoxious but the unfortunate part because we have such a big age gap is whenever i left for college he was you know 
seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And yeah. so I kind of missed out just being away on a lot of, I guess, what si- usually siblings have together is like the growing up piece. Um, so that was kind of a bummer. And I think that was partially why I ended up back in the Southeast Texas area after graduation from here, just to be close to him and like sort of develop huh. a relationship. Yeah. Um, now it's great. It's gotten a lot better <laughs> the older that he's gotten. Um, but I think, unfortunately for him, it's sort of like having three adults in the house, <laughs> like a third parent just kind of a bummer. Hmm. But I think he's grateful for it now. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what was your What was your first job like back in the day? Like not necessarily first job after school, but like first job period. Oh, man. I'm so proud of this. And I tell students this all the time. My yeah. first job was at Bridge City Dairy Queen. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yep. I was an ice cream girl. Yeah. Did you know that if they don't flip your blizzard, technically you get it for free? I did know that mm-hmm. because my mm-hmm. wife is a Dairy Queen aficionado. Oh, we and need I to talk. with a capital A. <laughs> Um, and she does, she let me in on the secret that if you don't, if they don't flip it, you're exactly as you said. I mean, one of the little hidden wonders of the state of Texas, I guess. Right. Stop saying. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was my first job. I loved it. I mean, I was happy to not do it anymore when I started really working, but it was fun during the time. (laughs) Who knows if this, this fails. I know. I could always go back. (laughs) I always go back. You're an alum. (laughs) What was your, what was your greatest challenge as a child? Oh, gosh. Um, I had this habit of only hanging out with or finding myself in friend groups with friends who were a lot smarter than me, um, which was... Yeah, I have that problem, too. Yeah. So I guess sort of an imposter syndrome, maybe, but that's just who I liked running with. And so probably my biggest struggle as a result of that was I just had to grind a lot harder than like everyone in my immediate circle that everything else just came super easy to them. Um, So probably that, I would say. I have not been able to solve the problem that way. Um, it still plagues me even now, I, I think. <laughs> but uh, my, my smarter friends like me. I was talking with one of our guests uh, a couple of weeks ago from the show who I have an enormous man crush on. And uh, <laughs> he is, you know, just kind enough to yeah. enlighten me as to all the stuff that he's noticed about the world that I'm just too kind of do do to notice. <laughs> so, uh, um, but thankfully I can just ask him about it and he'll tell me. Yeah, that's so, a good thing. You have like an endless encyclopedia right next to you. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Aaron. Yes. How many in your family? Uh, so it is the four of us, uh, mom, dad, and sister. Um, okay. She is not 11 years younger than me. Um, so she's about two and a half years younger than me. So we we kind of grew up uh, doing a lot of the same things, uh, had a lot of kind of the same peer groups. Um, yeah, it's kind of nice being that close in age. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What was your what was your very first job? Uh, the first, you know, kind of really official, like maybe paying job, like w 2 um, was working as a busboy. Uh, for a restaurant in okay. our, our local town. So it was kind of a, a fine dining-ish establishment. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was that was quite interesting. Uh, so I got to see the dynamics of, you know, kind of the, maybe the social class in our, oh. in our hometown. Yeah. Um, you know, people who come from means, people who are uh, doing fairly well in life. Um, you get some very interesting personalities um, when, yeah. that, when that comes to mind. But I just, I enjoyed it. This was my first like kind of restaurant job and just had a good time. What what surprised you the most about you you mentioned you get yeah. some personalities. Was there anything that jumped out at you? Uh, was there a story that was noteworthy? Not any particular story, but like people can be mean. Hmm. Yeah, people can be like very yeah. mean if you just like mess up. Uh like a very very simple mess up, like, oh my uh there, there's oil that I got on the table because uh the oil and bread that come out for free were, you know spilled okay i'm sorry you know sir ma'am how can we fix that for you <laughs> like, yeah. it's, it's very simple things that you just wouldn't think of are kind of a big deal to but i guess they're a big deal to some if you're going to pay x amount of money for uh, a meal you expect yeah. some some pretty quality service but um yeah that's it that's what i learned right hmm. people are mean people can be terrible it can be terrible yeah. right so <laughs> What so now that you have spent and Taylor, I want to come back to a couple of other background things for you. But Aaron, so now that you've spent time working mm-hmm. on sort of both sides of recruitment, yeah. what caught your eye about what corporations or you know, or businesses, anyone hiring, mm-hmm. what about what they look for in applicants? What was different than what you expected? What uh, what confirmed your expectations? Yeah, really good, really good question. Um, I, I think we tell students all the time, we just we talk through this all the time is if you can just demonstrate some sort of uh, ability on how you can do the job, I think that's really kind of the key of 
you know, getting, I guess we're really just kind of doing good work, right? Uh-huh. Uh, getting noticed, getting hired, right? You know, if, if I'm sitting on one side of the table interviewing a candidate um, and you can actually demonstrate to me that here are the skills that I bring, here are the qualifications that I bring and why, Yeah, uh, I think it's just, that, that seems to kind of unlock a lot of those, those simple questions of, well, you know, if I'm qualified or not, right? Um, I think we we always say this, and you'll probably hear it time and time again. Major does not define career. Mm, uh, I mean, that's, that is that's the truth. That's a big thing, um, you know, because you know we worked, you know, we, it's in the software company. Um, you know, we worked a lot with you know people who didn't necessarily either have degrees uh, and could code like out of their mind. Uh, worked with some like MBAs who um, just weren't that smart. Um, so you get, you know, kind of two Welcome. sides. Yeah, two Welcome sides. To the the table. <laughs> so that was, that was, uh, that, that was quite interesting. Um, but, but I think if you, again, going back to, if you can kind of demonstrate to me that, okay, I could probably do this work. That's what's going to stick out to a lot of, uh, a lot of teams, a lot of hiring managers. Um, and I guess on a side thing, can I work with you for 40 hours a week? Mm-hmm. Oh, very simple. Huh. Right. You know, can I can I sit across the table from you? You know, can I eat lunch with you without acting a fool? You know, <laughs> can you can you hold like a decent conversation with a client or a customer or just your peers, right? Somebody that you're you enjoy kind of working with and you enjoy showing up and it's like, oh man, I dread dread this person coming to work. Like, no, no, <laughs> it's okay. In terms of demonstrating ability to do mm-hmm. the job, what is the thing that you feel like students are not doing enough of? Yeah, I think it's really selling themselves so, so short uh, because it's not a, oh. a not a one for one, right? You know, I think what do you we, mean by that? If we if we think of maybe dissecting a job description, yeah, uh, and you, the, the job description I say is kind of the key. It's the legend. It's the map for kind of really what they're looking for. Yeah. Um, if that job description, if a student doesn't feel that they match one hundred percent of those bullets, or like, well, I didn't do. X, or I didn't do this. I haven't done this. I'm like, okay, let's reframe that thinking. Let's shift that thinking around. Say, what have you done that's similar, right? Uh-huh. What have you done that you could potentially demonstrate to me right there? And I think I've literally gone down list by list and say, okay, well, let's talk about these these skills and these experiences that you've had that could potentially demonstrate this bullet. All right, on to the next one. And so then you see that kind of that aha moment or that light bulb moment go off in that student's face. And uh, it's actually pretty neat uh, when you kind of uh, really simplify it for them, right? right. So just mm-hmm. kind of give them the confidence to to talk about in their own words, you know, how they're qualified just based on breaking down what it means to be uh, in that job. Right. Mm-hmm. So Taylor, for you, can you talk a little bit about the difference between working with high schoolers and then working with college students? Yeah. Um, so I primarily work with here first and second year students, which we split the several thousand students between right. the two of us. Um, and honestly, there's not, uh, I hate to say there's, there's really not a lot of difference. Uh, um, okay. Really in terms of sort of that value proposition piece. I think students don't often ascribe enough value to the things that they've done and they don't, they just don't feel empowered necessarily kind of right out of the gate. It sort of takes um, some faculty members, I guess their conversations with us, with maybe their advisors, it takes a few supporting conversations for them to, I guess, to see them in a profession, themselves in a professional role. Um, So Really, even from the high school standpoint, you know, kind of doing the high school to college with scholarship applications. I used to see this all the time. They would students would come in with just these killer credentials and all of the all of the boxes checked, you know, all of the pieces filled out. Um, And even then they would just not be super confident in in getting started. I don't know what it is, Um, but there's a lot of that even with students here. They go through this kind of gauntlet of an academic curriculum here at Mays or yeah. just on campus in general. And then whenever the time comes to apply to something full time, they're like, I don't know, I don't match this bullet exactly, or I've never done exactly this thing. And it's just trying to translate for them. But look, let's think about all of the things that you've done and the ways that this has you actually have gained these skills. If you can't you maybe haven't done this, but you could you could do this. You've done this in many other ways before. Um, so really that's there's not a lot of difference. It's just that confidence piece. Where do you two feel like students make the leap? Where, if you had to narrow it down to where does it happen, when does it happen most often? I think sophomore to junior year. Yeah. That's when I kind of see it starting. So it really, so it seems like Mm -hmm. maybe you two are splitting 
the, the splitting the population correctly then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, sometimes we see, you know, freshmen that are a little more accelerated than others, you yeah. know, seniors who have kind of, kind of lagged beyond uh, or lagged behind maybe some of their peers at that level. But Taylor's right. You know, that, that sophomore, junior year, kind of where you've established yourself as a freshman, like you, you kind of know the rhythm of college, you kind of know the rhythm of what to do, where to study, you know, your re- ideally your resources, you know, kind of where they are. Sophomore year, you're already kind of ingrained as far as kind of what you potentially want to do uh, and then started making decisions as maybe your internship, your work experiences. Um, you've likely already had like a student organization that you've been a part of and now are making that step into a leadership role. Yeah, mm-hmm. And so they're just kind of, by extension, just going into junior year, you, you're already prepared with some of that language that you can use when starting and applying for full-time roles, internships, et cetera. So yeah, that's a that's a great intersection. Well, and specifically for for the business disciplines, the employer interest in students really sort of moves into high gear for that sophomore, junior year. Freshmen don't have, they can certainly bring things to the table, but just with the timeline uh, and hiring cadence that employers are looking for, they're mm-hmm. usually not, you know, the front runners for internship opportunities. Right. So I think at the end of sophomore year, beginning junior year, they're getting, students are getting more traction with employers. Mm-hmm. And so they're feeling a little bit more validated, like, oh, wow, these full-time gigs, they really are interested in me. These big organizations do see value in who I am. And so, yeah, I mean, just to go off of that, I think that's that's kind of when it happens mm-hmm. and why. And even like working during the summers, maybe after freshman year, mm-hmm. uh, right? So maybe they actually did get a job on campus maybe the freshman year or they're coming back with a, with a different lens or they're coming back um, you know, kind of to their hometown working either a part-time gig or something a little bit more full-time. Just they, they have more to talk about. Yeah. Right. Talking about the the leap again Mm -hmm. if a student were trying to confidence is obviously a big part of this Mm -hmm. as you said Mm -hmm. but since confidence is an emotion really and it just is there or it's not and there's really not uh, it's it's hard to just make yourself more confident other than just by kind of faking it until you make it but Mm -hmm. let's hold that aside for a second (laughs) If a student were looking for a young student, were looking for a way to kind of hack that process a little bit Mm -hmm. and get to a spot where they can make that big step forward Uh a little bit earlier, one, would you encourage them to do that? And two, how would you recommend they do it? What's the what's the most important step that they could take that students just don't figure out how to take until later on? I think at least for freshmen, let's just we'll use that as the example. Um. I would encourage them, yes, to try to find that confidence. And one way to do that is to get involved in student organizations with oh. students that are older. Uh, um, I think take that, heed, students. Yeah, I think <laughs> a lot of students, especially that first year, you know, they're they're really just trying to jam with their peer group. They're trying to just find their way, be confident where they are or comfortable where they are. Um, putting themselves in positions with older students that maybe have some of those uh, some of those internal skills, that confidence uh, mm-hmm. can really be helpful that first year because they see it in action. They see right. what it looks like for someone even just one or two years older to be a little bit more together, I guess mm-hmm. you could yeah. say. Um, so that's what I would encourage. I just kind of use um, kind of going off of yours is the uh, they, they get, uh, I guess, an example of, you know, kind mm-hmm. of what what that actually looks like. They're they're able to process uh, and model what the I guess kind of what a business behavior might be or what a leadership behavior might be. Sure. Um, one thing that I would do is just encourage uh, and students to just go out and actually use your resources. That's that's kind of the, the biggest thing to kind of mm-hmm. get that confidence. Um, you know, coming in to maybe speak with Taylor and I uh-huh. uh, is mm-hmm. kind of a huge thing. Uh, we encourage that. So again, students, come come speak <laughs> with us. Come see these two. Other than you two, yeah. what's the most important resource they need to be using that not enough people are necessarily using? I think Career Center, I would say Academic Success yeah. Center. I think that can really mm-hmm. um, that can really nix confidence pretty yeah. quickly if students come in and maybe don't have yeah. as strong of a first semester or a semester. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we all have been there, yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Your humble pie served up warm. Yes. Um, so just piping hot in my case. Piping <laughs> hot. Yeah. Um, that can be helpful too. Mm-hmm. that class confidence. If they're not doing well in class, that's, that's really hard. It's yeah. a big barrier. Yeah. yeah. Even caps, like mm-hmm. always, always a good one. It's okay to ask. It's okay to ask for help. Right. That's the biggest thing. I mean, we, we still struggle with it. Uh, the collective, we, like, I'm not going right. to speak for Taylor or anything like that, but, no, but for real, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, we still struggle with that confidence and we still struggle with, you know, kind of asking for help and using those resources. Um, but I think if you kind of provide just a sense of, Hey, you know what, it's, it's going to be okay. Right. Right. 
it's okay to ask for help um, because you need help and that's and that's fine i don't know it's it's a very simple way of maybe saying things but mm-hmm. um yeah go out and use your resources okay they're there for you yeah mm-hmm. how has the college's approach to career management changed with the workplace and how is it changing obviously the days as our listeners have heard a thousand times the days of Spending 50 years with one company, th- those days are gone. But the workplace is also changing in other ways as we speak. Mm-hmm. What what are the most important adaptations that you're making? I think um, maybe something that I'm that I'm doing, and I know employers are doing as well, is they're 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 kind of listening to the student uh, a little bit more. Okay. Um, Meaning the, the the student is going to be providing valuable feedback, or early career professionals are going to be providing valuable feedback. Because I mean, in a sense, they are kind of the future of that organization. They mm-hmm. are the future of the company. Yeah. Uh, and if you can get a student, or again, an early career professional, to kind of buy in at a um, kind of that ground level or very entry level thing, um, they have this sense of ownership in the work. Okay. All right. So as you're advancing within your career, whether it be one organization or the other, um, if I have an employer that's going to listen to me as a early career career professional, um, nine times out of 10, I'm likely to stay with that employer for a good amount of time. Right. So as an employer, you know, kind of reverse that. It's like, you know, maybe I should be listening to my early career folks because they're either going to be the the future of the organization or they're going to be working for my competitor. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and yeah, I mean, that absolutely. And the nature of social media and how we all have a voice that Mm -hmm. a few Mm -hmm. decades ago wasn't the case. Um, I think employers, at least the vast majority that we work with, are are well aware of that. And so I think um, the candidate experience is changing. I think they're really trying to put a lot more intentional intentional thought into that onboarding process, even the interview pipeline, what that looks like Mm -hmm. for the simple fact of, I mean, and it's definitely self-serving, but for the simple fact of if this, if students don't have a good experience with me, they will tell their friends. Mm. Um, And even if they're not the best fit for that organization, you know, you don't want there to ever be sort any sort of negative, I don't know, assumption floating around Mm -hmm. about their onboarding process or how they treat their young employees. So even that. So it would seem like the best approach for a student's for for a student in this environment from a variety of perspectives is be assertive, believe in yourself, speak your mind. Yeah. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah. Speak your mind, just don't be rude or crass. Right. 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 That's <laughs> right. Yeah. There's, there's kind of that fine line of providing um good feedback, mm-hmm. uh, but also providing feedback that's just like you're just complaining. Right. Right. It it strikes me as more maybe more of a collaboration than it used to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Definitely. Well, and even whenever we're doing interview prep with students, Mm -hmm. right, we really try to drive home that point of, yes, the organization is interviewing you, but you are also interviewing them. You want to make sure that this is a good culture fit for you, that you understand their values, that you're um, that those are consistent with yours. And I think everyone in the room, if if that's if that's the goal, if that's the awareness, I think everyone in the room only serves to gain Uh um, because it's not then just that the student wasn't a good fit professionally. If they're not a good fit culturally, that's, that's good for all parties. There's probably a better fit somewhere for both or for Uh both institutions. So Uh, where do you, where do you find that cuts the most in terms of cultural fit? Let's just say you have a student who's Mm -hmm. professional in an organization that's well run. Where do you find the conflict arises most often in terms of culture fits? Like what are the landmines that students wouldn't think of that they need to be keeping an eye out for? Ooh, I think that's a great question. One yeah. that comes to mind first is um, professional development opportunity, room okay. for growth. Uh-huh. Oh. Um, I think students, because especially here, they're put through such a rigorous curriculum. They're, you know, they really are kind of competitive from the outset. Even if they don't have a lot of confidence, they're even with their own performance, they're competitive. Yeah, they they need to feel, especially with all the research we've done with just Gen Z, mm-hmm. they need to feel that their contribution is valuable and they want to be able to grow. Okay. Um, they're not really comfortable in stagnation. And so uh, it might take one to two years for a student to start to think, oh gosh, you know, are there any new projects I can take on? Are there ways for me to grow? Are there things I can learn? Mm-hmm. And if an organization doesn't 
steward that kind of growth, right. then that could be a problem. Yeah, and it's also can kind of uh, with the student, you, you cannot confuse growth with advancement within the organization. Mm-hmm. Right. That's that's kind of a big thing that I've that I've seen. And like, I want to be the CEO in two years. I'm like, well, that's great. That's yes. likely not going to happen. <laughs> right. Uh, that sort of thing. We, we've seen that. And that's if that, only it did. that's fine. Like you, you can have goals. You can have, you know, things that you want to aspire to be. But that's that's fine. But, you know, kind of with with Taylor's point about the culture and your question is um, really try to find those opportunities within your own position to just grow a little bit more both within the trainings that you're getting both with the the people that you're interacting with um the the mentors that you're you're kind of reaching out to uh provide kind of that holistic understanding of what i am learning and how am i enriching myself as as a professional hmm. i like that i like that is so we've talked some around this already but is there a in the internship search process, in the job search mm-hmm. process, is there a is there a one weird trick in terms of uh, we, we've talked about sort of the the big picture stuff that yep. you need to be doing differently? But is there some is there a small step that students can take to make that process more productive to make it easier? Is there a, is there an inefficiency that is maybe a little bit less obvious. Uh, let's see. Might so, not be. Yeah. So, so one that I always encourage <laughs> students to do is they just don't, I, I, it sounds weird, but don't stop applying. Like oh. it, you're really not done in, with your job search until your internship search. And you have, until you have signed that document until you have accepted of that offer and you are, you know, getting that background check process, right? We can all, you know, put in our application to, you know, 10 different, you know, companies for internships for full-time companies. Um, but, you, you just don't stop, right? Um, you can't just sit back and wait for them to call you. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of be, take that more proactive approach and follow up and keep applying. Uh, and again, until you have that signature on that piece of paper on that offer letter, you're not done. Yeah. The only other kind of complimentary tip I would give to that is um, because the the onboarding process or the internship hire process, full-time hire process seems very, um, there's definitely a cadence, right? There are certain seasons, like fall is a really heavy recruitment time. Right. Um, I think perhaps an inefficiency, not so much in action, but just in kind of mind frame, can be when students go through all of the same steps as maybe their peers, and then they don't have the same success or oh, their process yeah. looks differently. Right. Um, so I would say maybe one of those hiccups or inefficiencies could be just paying a ton of attention to what your peers are doing or how their search process is going. Hmm. Because, I mean, we all know, like, everyone's career path is super different. It's not linear. You know, everyone can be – we've had students that maybe have no success in fall, but then they have three offers concurrently in spring mm-hmm. for really great internships um, or really great jobs. So, yeah. Um, yeah, like, the process is never done. Continue searching. Continue looking until you have signed an offer. But also just don't don't put a lot of stress or effort into trying to match what your peers are doing because it's it's a different journey for everybody. But it sounds like you, the 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 paradox there is you do want to see what they're doing, mm-hmm. it, 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 even if you're not trying to copy them exactly. Right. Yep. Um, I think their maybe their definition of success and uh, it might be a little bit different from yours. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. So that's. Yeah. Uh, that's tough. We try to kind of rein it in, and we, we do this all the time. We compare ourselves to other folks. We compare ourselves yeah, to it's impossible you know, not. yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it is joy exactly sure. right. Uh, so that's uh, we definitely recognize that and want to want to call that out for our students as well. Like you know, it's it's a very natural tendency for you to do that. But uh, if you're not there yet, um, if you need just a little bit of extra work, or if you just need to kind of t- t- tweak this one part, that's all right because it's 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 honestly it's not Taylor and I's career journey, right? Mm-hmm. It's the student's career journey, right? So so let's kind of express that. Somebody compared recently the career process rather than um, rather than like thinking of it like a like a football pass or a, like a dart yeah. throw. Mm-hmm. Think of it as like an archaeological dig, like you're you're oh, wow. sort of unearthing mm-hmm. a career. And yeah. use that I, I kind of liked that analogy. Yeah. Please, I might use yeah, it. yeah, yeah, please use it. It's I mean it's definitely true in my case. Yeah, I'm, seriously, I'm, have 
moved around quite a bit. <laughs> yep. Not not I mean locationally too, right. but also in career terms. Let's briefly talk about resumes. Oh. Is there any real way to differentiate in a positive way with a resume or is it mainly about once everybody has checked all these boxes, you're really not going to get beyond sufficient conditions or sorry, necessary conditions. Right. Mm-hmm. It's uh it, it is there a way to differentiate? I can. Rock, paper, scissors for <laughs> Probably. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know if there's really a way to differentiate, but I do think that there is a way to make sure that you're very intentional with the job description for the resume that you're mm. submitting. Oh, okay. I yep. think, um, and it's not necessarily, you know, like with a cover letter or a letter of intent, those are, those need to be really customized for whatever the role is that you're applying for. But you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel every time with your resume, but right. a lot of students will maybe not touch it again <laughs> until, mm-hmm. um, you know, that they won't touch it after they begin the application process until maybe the very end. And then they'll say, oh, maybe this wasn't the best fit for this role or right. something. Right. Um, so, yeah, kind of some middle internal tweaks to that document, too. Mm-hmm. And don't be afraid to move things around on the resume, um, like even within kind of the bullets. Uh, that's that's quite all right. You can move bullets up. You can move bullets down. You yeah. can move sections up. You can move sections down. Uh, mm-hmm. Kind of uh, really just kind of. Uh, be mindful of your audience, right? Yes. Your audience is, this resume ultimately is not for you. Yes, it's your document, but it's not for you, right? right. It, it's for whoever's trying to hire you for whatever that internship opportunity uh, and whoever's going to be looking at it. I always feel like it's so harsh, but I I feel like I mention this every time I'm reviewing a resume, just to remind the students that, uh, and we do, I mean, all of us do this. We try, we write resumes super reflective of how we've grown or how we've mm-hmm. developed or what skills we've attained. And like the employers don't, I hate to say this, but that's not what they care about. Like mm-hmm. they care about what can you bring to my organization. Right. So you should write your information on that resume with that in mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not super reflective. It's really value driven. Yep. The the resume is not going to get you the job, right? It's going to mm-hmm. get you an interview. Yes. Right? There's there's kind of steps in that process. So. Mm-hmm. Let's uh, let's make it a little bit more efficient for for the reader, right? As somebody who's read two hundred plus a day, please make it more efficient for the reader. So <laughs> that is a good answer yeah. to the question. We touched on this earlier in terms of major doesn't define career. Mm-hmm. Specialization is kind of a buzzword that gets thrown around in education. Um, some students may not give themselves the opportunity to diversify or to consider something outside yeah. major. Let's you know what. Let's go at this question from the other direction, because I think everyone like everyone would agree it's good not to limit yourself. But in terms of what your major, what how your major does define your search process, what what components of the search process or the career development process should students be very cognizant of their major in you know, in informing or in choosing, huh. what does your major, how does your major shape you, limit you? Uh, what What are the things that students need to be aware of? Yeah, um, we'll probably just dialogue with this. Um, yeah. The, I think what we've seen is major at least helps uh, give students a frame, just a frame of reference, mm-hmm. right? Kind of a, that jumping off point, right? Mm-hmm. The, the the reason why they're uh, choosing this major, the reason why they're potentially going into this profession is because they they like aspects of it, right? You don't have to like aspects of all of it, which you know, sometimes we don't like aspects of, of all of what we do, uh, but uh, you at least chose it for a reason, yeah. right? And so let's kind of use that as that jump off point because, okay. you know, every single major has so many arms and so many, you know, you know, fingers that you can kind of just go off of, right? So it's the it's the very, the baseline mm-hmm. of, of kind of where to explore. And then from there, we can talk about maybe those transferable skills that you're learning within those major. Right. Um, talk about um, you just you just give me an example of you know customers. Right. Every major has to deal with customers. Right. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's working with a difficult customer, serving customers, helping customers, helping clients, that sort of thing. A lot of that stuff is major agnostic. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um, I have a, an example of this actually of someone I talked to on Friday. A uh, PhD student in material science in the part the College of Engineering and she wants to go into business consulting and we had a pretty interesting conversation about how her research skills could translate into a consulting role and 
I mean, probably at first glance, it feels like a reach. But when you're talking about research working in teams, having to be really efficient with detail, having mm-hmm. to be able to to translate output to in maybe layman's terms, you know, all of that definitely has value in the oh. consulting world. Hmm. Um, so I think that that's I mean, it definitely gives you a frame. But if you think about the curriculum that you're studying and kind of what makes it successful that's really kind of where you find the pieces of oh i could do this work this is makes sense i've had exposure to some of this Mm -hmm. before good stuff Mm -hmm. and i like the term major agnostic as well Mm -hmm. this whole thing has been a nice vocabulary building exercise it's it's i don't know i like to use agnostic yeah and that sounds sounds fancy it is fun it's a good fancy word agnostic (laughs) yeah so i hang out with the smartest people (laughs) (laughs) you're too kind right yeah (laughs) what are what are the most popular internships, industries, jobs right now, are there any that you feel students are maybe overrating a little bit, maybe underrating a little bit? What are, they, what are students interested in and what should they be interested in? I'm wondering yeah. about tech giants, Amazon, mm-hmm. Facebook, Google, mm-hmm. like that's, it feels like that's, those are the jobs that it, yeah. in the MBA program, those are the jobs everyone was talking about, not mm-hmm. necessarily seeking, but it's all, that's always the buzz. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a great point. They, w- what I've seen, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this as well with, uh, with employers, they, they tend to go after the bigger names because mm-hmm. it's familiar in terms of the universities they're right. recruiting. Yeah. Just universities they're recruiting. Um, uh, that brand just, recognition. Yeah, that brand recognition. So sure. brand is like a huge thing, which is which is great. I mean, we all subscribe to bland, blands, brands. Brands. Uh, <laughs> I subscribe to Blands. Well. Blands. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Subscribe to Blands. Um, yeah. I all subscribe to you know kind of going after that that big name, that big brand, because there's just something associated with it. It's like, hey, you know, I I got an internship for you know X company. I'm not going to call it any specific companies because you know we're <laughs> there are a lot of big brands, a lot of big brands uh, yeah. in the building, which yeah. which is great. Uh, but, but sometimes I, I try to get students to maybe focus on the actual job itself and maybe not necessarily the name uh, of the company, because mm. mm-hmm. um, you, know, you could potentially learn a lot more from maybe kind of a, a smaller organization rather than maybe a, a large, you know, Fortune 100 company. Um, I think you might have a little bit more flexibility with kind of what you do on a day-to-day basis, say if you're going through, again, a Fortune 100 versus maybe like kind of a, a startup where you're wearing a lot of different hats. Sure. So uh, I think that's where it comes to that personal personalization piece and they're really, you know, qu- kind of questioning that student to say, okay, what are your, what are your values? You know, kind of what are your long-term goals? What is important to you? You know, if it's important to you to kind of work for a large organization, that's great. Let's give you the tools to actually search for those. Mm-hmm. But if you're kind of still unsure or if you want to explore uh, kind of wearing a lot of hats or, you know, kind of really good at multitasking, that sort of thing. Well, let's, let's take a look at maybe some of these smaller organizations that might um, allow you to, uh, flex more of your muscles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All of that. Cool. That sort of leads into something that I um, um something that was not on our on our show outline, but has been in my mind a lot recently is that students and young people and people in general seem to be more interested in entrepreneurship than they ever have mm-hmm. been, and one of the things one I think one of the biggest mistakes that I made in my earlier career. And I don't know if I'd call it a mistake necessarily, because there's always an opportunity to go back and do it. And that's what I'm doing now. But one of the things that I would have done differently if I had it to do over would be to pursue more formal education in the entrepreneurship process. Mm -hmm. So, but that's not, that's not necessarily the right thing for everyone so what would you say to a student who wants a job and mm-hmm. wants a wants a steady paycheck but is maybe interested in owning their own company someday maybe it is pursue exactly as you said pursuing a job where they would get to wear a lot of different hats mm-hmm. but what other steps would you encourage students to take if they are potentially interested in entrepreneurship what are the things that they may not be thinking of that they should be doing I kind of think, uh, especially if a student came to me with that long-term goal really early in the process, I would maybe challenge them to try something on a really small scale in that way. That could be starting a new student organization. Oh, okay. Um, that could be, I don't know, I have a few students that you know, have Etsy shops or Mm -hmm. they have some sort of small venture that they're already doing on their own. But basically, um, you know, practice that potential of starting something brand new that has the risk of failure right. and just see how 
how that feels for you, if that drives you to, if you still want to chase that goal, if that was energizing. I mean, for some students, that's really exciting and they love that idea. Um, But from a non-classroom standpoint, that's probably what I would encourage if they were asking really early on. Mm -hmm. Um, What about you? Um, I think start building your network a little bit early. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's kind of a big one. I mean, there's a lot of uh, you know, different startup places in the the bigger cities. Uh, obviously, there's startup Aggie Land where you can kind of get plugged in uh, here. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> shut up. Um, but yeah, really and really try to get an understanding of what it what it truly means to be an entrepreneur, right? Mm. Is it just do you see you know kind of uh, the flash and the pizzazz kind of surrounding? I, I want to be my own boss. I don't want to have anybody report to. That's that's awesome. Like. That, kudos to you because I don't. I don't think I could do that. Uh, well, just, I bet you're also working way more than forty hours a week. Yeah, you know it doesn't look that way yeah. from the inside. And so it's it's like you're 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 wholly invested into mm-hmm. this, like uh, financially, emotionally, uh, mentally, um, and, and so that could potentially affect whether you, you know, pursue it or you kind of dip your toe into it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, yeah, just really get an understanding and, and really talk to those that are, you know, maybe just starting out for maybe those who are successful in it uh, to kind of get a good grasp of, okay, how did I start out? Here are my struggles. Here's what I could do. You know, if I had to do it all over again, here's what I do. Um, yeah, I think that's maybe that would be my biggest thing. Mm-hmm. Start networking early. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Building that out and giving yourself an opportunity to try mm-hmm. a new venture or whatever that might look like. Yep. Yeah. One thing a lot of people don't understand about entrepreneurship is you do still have a boss. <laughs> Demand is your boss. <laughs> the market is your boss. And the market is a ruthless boss. Yes. Yeah. That's very true. Time. Yeah. Taylor, can you talk about your fundraising efforts for scholarships at Texas A&M a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I was kind of reflecting on this over the weekend. Um I feel like for my entire career, I've been making the case for education in some sense of the word, which is never what I thought I'd be doing. But um, when I was living in the Beaumont area, I found myself w- looking to grow my network, uh, getting being plugged in again with Aggies. And um, I found the Southeast Texas A&M Foundation, the Beaumont A&M Club, and they are one of the oldest local clubs in existence. Um, they've raised, generally they raise around $25,000 a year um, and have anywhere from, you know, 10 to 15 students on scholarship at a time, which Mm -hmm. for a small organization like that, you know, maybe 200 members is pretty good. Um, But my experience and the fascinating thing is I was really active in that organization, even while running a scholarships department for another university. So um, (laughs) that shows my loyalty, I guess. Um, I think the fascinating thing is just how bought in former students are to this place and to everything that this institution stands for. Mm -hmm. It's never a hard sell. Um, And we did a lot of fundraisers that took the form of like, I don't know, link sales, golf tournaments, um, scholarship nights where we'd have like guest speakers come in. Um, And even really small investments for a young alumni base. I'm still going to count myself as a young alumni. I'm going to do that for as long as possible. (laughs) Um, But for people like me and even more recent graduates, those that's really attainable. That's an investment that they can do and that they're comfortable with. And they still see themselves as graduates like they were. Oh, I was just there 10 years ago doing this, you know, Um, so it was a really fun experience, and we're still super plugged in with that organization at home. Uh, we're not as active on the fundraising side because we don't, you know, we don't live locally anymore. But um, it was a lot of fun, made a lot of great connections, and that was personally one of the biggest pieces to me growing my own professional network. You know, Aggies mm-hmm. love to give advice, so if you just put yourself out there, they will take you and dump it on you. That's Beautiful. great. Not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I still count myself as young alumni too. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what's the threshold? Yeah. Do we know when you can stop, when you stop doing that? I don't know. I graduated two years ago. So. Okay. Well then, yeah, yeah you're definitely yeah. still in that bracket. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at me like that, Julie. <laughs> uh, okay. Aaron, what do you say to juniors and seniors who don't know what they want to be when they grow up? Oh man. The question. Uh, the, 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 million dollar question uh that sort of thing uh i you know i I give a little humor in this i am still waiting for that growing up part uh so i don't think that uh yeah vertically challenged here this is this is always a good time um i think honestly that's uh just reassure them that that's okay right 
it's really okay if you don't know what you want to do. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of the fear might come into jumping into something that you don't know what it's going to be like. And that, I think as professionals and maybe as young career professionals, we, we all have to just kind of make that jump and make that leap into something because you, yeah. you, you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and if you don't like it, that's okay. Um, I think you're going to be learning something. You're going to be taking something from whatever organization that you're going to be a part of. Yeah. Um, and you're going to apply that long term, mm -hmm. right? So I 100% you know, was a different person now than I was back when I first started my career, you know, post grad. My values have changed, my goals have changed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, looking back, I mean, there are some positions that I, I really loved, but there are some positions that I really didn't like so much. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's okay. I, I learned from it. I took from it. Um, I think that's kind of one piece of advice. Like, honestly, it never, it never stops juniors and seniors. Like it's, it's okay if you don't know what you want to do right now, yeah. at least gets you doing something. Huh. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else, Taylor? Well, I'm just thinking back on that archaeological dig yeah, reference. Right? I mean, yeah, that's right. part of the, it doesn't sound fun, I guess, whenever you're 21, 22 mm. and you have, you're falling off mom and dad's payroll or yeah, you're falling out scary. of school soon and you that's have a to good have a phrase. plan. Uh -huh. A lot of good phrases today, falling off mom and dad's payroll. Yeah. yeah um, but I guess just focus on the dig, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. what will you find? It'll be a lifelong journey. Yeah. You don't have to have the answers right now. What do you consider your most valuable failure? Oh, gosh. Honestly, probably what we were just talking about. Um, I sort of knew what I was going to do. I had an idea of like a field of discipline. But I mean, really, for personal reasons and just trying to figure it out, I got into my first job, which I mean, even doing like donor functions, it does. It sounds cooler than it is. It was a lot of schlepping tables and like <laughs> being really sweaty in work clothes and trying to make people have a great experience and like really stressing out about the details. And, um, but it was in that job that I got connected with my graduate program, that I met my husband, that like even probably my most valuable mentor, she was my first boss. We still talk probably three or four times a week on our way to work every day. Um, so probably that, like not having a plan because it gave me so much on the, on the other side. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? 30 seconds or less. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I I find myself being pretty direct. I don't know why that is. I just do. And I think maybe the misconception is that people that are direct are, I don't know, maybe don't put a ton of thought into what they're saying. Oh, okay. But I like literally <laughs> obsess over everything that leaves my mouth yeah. before it does. And then after I worry about it, too. So maybe that. I don't know, I guess. Yeah. So people think you don't think you're not thinking about what you're saying? Yeah, but everything, I think everything that comes out of my mouth is generally really intentional okay. and really thought out. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably not a great answer. <laughs> That's good. I, I come off answer, really yeah. mean, but I'm actually That's really obsessive. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. What really about what about you? Um, I think sometimes I'm uh, maybe they think I'm apathetic. Right. Huh. Uh, how I how I absorb information, how I take information is I just kind of sit there and literally just absorb it. Right. Uh, so just because I don't have like any sort of like facial expression or just any expression whatsoever uh, doesn't mean that I don't care about what you're saying or don't doesn't mean that um, what you're saying is not interesting. Right. Uh, I'm just kind of taking time to process it. So, hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So could that boil down to for both of you, could that boil down to some flavor of people think that you're not as nice as you actually are? Could be, Probably. Like, yeah, maybe. I don't know, but then I, we get feedback. I don't know if you haven't noticed, we're kind of like the Bopsy twins. We usually also dress alike. Yeah, we were really worried that was going to happen today. Actually, true. Yes. Um, but <laughs> the <do> feedback <laughs> we get is basically that we're both really delightful. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Maybe yeah. we have terrible, like self awareness. Yeah, a, a conflated sense of kind of who we are, yeah. which which is fine. Like I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah. I think I'm things. great. I think you're great. So. Oh, thanks. Ditto. Well, there you go. See, there you go. <laughs> If you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? Oh, man. I actually thought about this one uh, for a little bit, and it's super weird. I, I really want to be friends. Uh, I guess maybe this is a different thing, but I really want to hang out with, like, Dak Shepard and Kristen Bell. Like, huh? I just admire just who they are as a people. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I admire just kind of their, I don't know, their, their real, uh, the, the kind of that parasocial relationship that, uh, <laughs> that you're talking about, about celebrities and, and that sort of thing. But it's just kind of how how they carry themselves, who they are, yeah. um, you know, kind of what, what they've lived. They're very honest. They're very real. They're very open. And so um, if I could aspire to be that or aspiring to be that, I mean, 
Yeah. Uh, mentor for one day. Um, so my practice answer, I really would love to hang out with Barbara Walters for the day. Okay. But my real answer, I would love to hang out with Jimmy Buffett for a day. Oh, what a great answer. <laughs> I don't know if we've gotten that one before. Yeah. I just being real with everyone. Yeah, as you should be. Yeah. What is the most important advice you would give to yourself exactly five years ago? If you are put in conversations or in like high stakes work situations Mm -hmm. that like I have every right to be there and what I can contribute is really important. And um, probably like a lot of long, a lot of young, what's going on with my mouth today? A lot of young female professionals. I think Mm -hmm. it takes a little bit longer to feel like you have a space at the table or that your opinion is valued. And I was really struggling with that about five years ago. And I wish I could go back and say, what you're saying is is legit. You've really thought about this. You have good perspective. Probably that. Right. Do you feel that there was a way in which you were guided toward being a little bit more defensive rather than risk taking in your professional in your professional life, your personal life? Do you think that there was advice that you were given that was gender specific that made you feel a little bit more of the imposter syndrome, but also just to be a little bit more cautious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, full disclosure, I'm a first generation student. And so I, I'm i really fortunate in that my mom, even like having never been in this space before, yeah. uh, from a young age, I've, I've heard this once, I've heard it 5,000 times, there is a graceful way to say everything oh. and you should say exactly what you mean. Okay. Um, and so having that, I guess, just kind of beat into me, even in scenarios early on as a professional, when the situation felt like it didn't steward that output from okay. me, Yeah. Um, that was always like in the back of my mind. But I guess it wasn't until, um, gosh, it probably wasn't until honestly through my graduate program. I had s- some faculty in that program that were just really encouraging of saying what you're thinking of being being who you are you know kind of owning what your opinion is yeah um but, you know it needs to be researched it needs to be based in in something thoughtful but you know using your voice um that that kind of all started to to manifest for me and that even now is how I try to do things. I mean, even when being direct or even if that like read on myself is super wrong, even when being direct, if it feels aggressive, I really try very hard to be. I think that a lot of females don't, they don't know how to balance that, right? It's like that age old problem of you can be really nice or you can be really powerful. Like you can't be both. Um, I I don't need to be really either one. I think Mm -hmm. that you can like have a really good valuable opinion and also be kind and treat others with respect yeah um so i hopefully that sort of answers the question (laughs) i think It, it definitely does answer the question and i think that there is a kind of there there is a kind of love that very strong people are capable of that is somehow less meaningful coming from someone who doesn't have the capacity to like fight and die for what they believe in Mm -hmm. or speaking frankly to kill for what they believe in Mm -hmm. um and uh so i like that answer oh thanks yeah i love that question (laughs) thank you well credit to credit to shannon for that Um, most important advice you would give yourself exactly five years ago? Um, God, enjoy the ride. Oh, right. Yeah. I love that. Enjoy the ride. Yeah. I think the the reason being, maybe just five years ago, reflecting back, um, on it, you know, kind of both, both my wife and I were kind of at this time in, in both of our careers where we just needed, uh, we needed maybe something different. Uh, I Hmm. think, you know, for, um, it's not like that we didn't like our jobs. It's just, you know, something was, something was up, up. We get this like gut feeling, this innate feeling uh, about, I, I just need something different. Right. Um, and so we, we, I mean, we almost like packed it up and like, you know what, we're going to sell everything and we're going to go to Colorado. Uh, we're going to, you know, live in like, Estes Park. We're going to, yeah. you know, basically just work by, by cleaning cabins. Huh. Right. Like yeah. very, very That's simple. so cool. Right. I, yeah. I mean, that'd be, that'd be sweet. Uh, the Estes Park part. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or career advising is Estes Park. Yeah. Goals. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, I, I didn't take into account that, um, I guess maybe I just wasn't counting my blessings at the time. 
right? Um, and I really needed to kind of take a, take a step back and reflect on kind of what got me here today, um, what are the good things in my life, um, and kind of using those to kind of propel through, yeah. right? So sit back, enjoy the ride, you're gonna be fine, and here we are. What's the most important single thing that you do to enjoy the ride now? What's the step? Um, that's a big hack for you. To I, you know, I, yeah, that, that, is, that is a good one. Uh, I think it's, it's, I, I make an intentional effort to physically stop. Oh, when I was the bus boy, yeah. right. I, there was a sous chef that gave me some actually really sage advice. Um, he said, if you're in a rut, um, walk a different way to class, hmm. drive a different way to work. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe here, maybe, maybe take the bus to campus, that sort of thing. Cause you're gaining new perspective on things. You, you're absorbing different information. Um, and so that, I, I think that's helped me. Yeah. Huh. Very nice. A couple of great Tim Ferriss questions. What is the book you've given most often as a gift? Or if you're not a book giver, then what is the book <laughs> you've recommended most often? Um, so we have uh, seven nieces and one nephew Yeah, under the age of five, six, something like that. So, And you're, you had one sibling. One sibling. So my, my wife's family have, uh, she has oh, two other okay, siblings. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I was, I was like, oh man. Your one like, sibling is bad. One si I mean, <laughs> do what you got to do, man. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, it's a funny book. It's, so the book that I've given the most, uh, it's a children's book. Yeah. It's uh, the, the Brown Bear, Brown Bear. What do you what see? What do you see? Oh, I love I read that to my daughter like three days ago. Love that. Uh, <laughs> so kind of a quick time for that backstory uh, with Brown Bear, Brown Bear. Please. Uh, growing up, uh, my mother was an educator. Yeah. And so she spent time basically educating, you know, kindergarten to, I think the most she did was like first grade. So kindergarten, first grade, pre-K, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, when my father was stationed in Germany, he was in the army. Um, my mom actually met Bill Martin Jr. Yeah. And so brown bear, brown bear, right? Yeah. Um, chicka, chicka, boom, boom, you know, the whole, yeah, I love these things. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that, you know, it's so it's such a really cool book and um we ended up when we moved back to texas from germany then colorado to texas um we met up with him he lived in commerce for a good amount of time before he passed and so mm -hmm. i remember as a kid going to his house in commerce and getting all of his like original work and just you know kind of connecting with bill martin jr uh -huh. um so but brown bear brown cool. bear is the gift that we always give to our nieces and nephews or somebody that's that's born because it's it's a neat book yeah <laughs> It is a pretty neat book. There you go. Um, I've only given this book away, I think, once, but I've recommended it several times. And it was actually recommended to me by my husband. Hmm. Uh, it's called Quiet Strength. It's like a, a book about Tony Dungy, uh, yeah. NFL oh, yeah. coach, commentator. Mm -hmm. um, he just had some, he had a really interesting journey and he had some pretty rough things happen in his life. Um, he lost his son. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's just really good. And I think it jives with me because it just reminds me of the guy that I married. He's sort of like that. So it just has like lots of positive vibes. But that's a good one. I like that one. We end each session with Good Bull opportunity to recognize someone else for something great they've done. you have anyone you would like to send Good Bull? Um, I guess maybe my collective family, maybe more specifically my spouse. Um, so I, I recently started my graduate program this semester. And so with, uh, I'm sure, any graduate program, uh, it requires a significant time investment. Uh, and so, uh, you know, thankful to her and thankful to my family for uh, allowing me to strategically be neglectful of, 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 of kind of my time and uh, also the support that they're giving uh, and just kind of the outpouring of love um, to basically saying you can do it. So mm -hmm. good bull to my wife and yeah, good bull to my family. Good bull. Mm -hmm. Title of the show, Strategic Neglect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about you? Oh, man. Good bull um, to anyone? Yeah. So mine is going out to some of our dearest friends, uh, Joe and Geneva Peters in Beaumont, Texas. Uh, they have, Joe has been involved with the Beaumont A&M Club for, I think, 54 years now. Um, and he, I was did the math last week. If we're set, I mean, if they have raised consistently around 25000 a year, he has personally been involved with over $1.2 million worth of scholarships for Aggies in his, the course of his career. And he actually never graduated from A&M. Oh. He's just, he was here for a little while and had some family stuff come up. He had to go home and he just loves his place. And his wife is his, really, she runs the show, but Joe and Geneva Peters, Beaumont, Texas. Beautiful. 
I think that's a, I think that's a wrap. That's it. Sweet. That's a wrap. Thank cool. you both for your time. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Great work. Thank you for watching. We appreciate your support. Drop us a like below and feel free to leave a comment if you wish. We appreciate positivity and constructive feedback. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date on our latest episodes and bonus content. You can also take us on the road using your favorite podcast listening app. We have those linked below. If you'd like to know more about Mays Business School or our guests, visit mays.tamu.edu forward slash podcasts. Talk with you soon.